The lead up to a new Zelda game's release is one of the most exciting times for us as fans and creators. Our imaginations can run wild with endless speculation and theorizing as we try to crack codes or predict important elements of the game. Needless to say, after Breath of the Wild's success, the hype for its sequel, Tears of the Kingdom, was extremely palpable online. The game has now been out for some time, and I'd say that the dust has mostly settled, but it is always fun to look back on that time and see what we were saying in the lead up to a game's release, and perhaps more interestingly, to see what exactly we managed to predict successfully. Some things now seem painfully obvious, but that is just how these things go. A bit of history. I myself have been involved in the creator space for quite some time, whether it be here on my own channel or other channels that I've worked on previously. And so during the lead up to this game, I threw my hat in the ring a number of times. So that's what we're examining today. I wanted to look back on the videos I worked on over the years and see how I fared with predicting things about this game and how many of my videos unfortunately aged like milk. Let's hop right into it. In this video from June of 2021, I talked specifically about how the Switch could read save data from Breath of the Wild and carry certain elements over to its sequel. It starts out fairly reasonably. I successfully predicted here that we'd actually start the game with full hearts and stamina, and that the game's introduction would strip those away from us. My next point in the video is all about horses, which I also get pretty much 100% correct. Horses that you have registered at stables do indeed carry over from your Breath of the Wild save file. So, off to a good start. My next point, however, is incorrect. This video was made before we'd seen any sign of the Master Sword breaking. In fact, we still only had that 2019 announcement trailer to go off of, since the next trailer would come out a few weeks later. My prediction was that we'd be keeping the Master Sword, and that potentially our progress through Trial of the Sword would carry over. Since the sword breaks in the game's introduction, however, that is basically null and void. Though if we want to get really into specifics, the sword behaves as normal pre-trial of the sword during Tears of the Kingdom's prologue scene anyways, so this idea doesn't come into play whatsoever. The same can be said for my next idea, which was that any inventory upgrades you had gotten from Hestu in Breath of the Wild could be carried over, and that you should be able to expand your inventory even further. Again, this is simply not the case. Tears of the Kingdom completely resets your inventory capacity, including the added pocket space, having us restart our Korok Seed Collectathon. I end the video saying that since Breath of the Wild was released on on Wii U as well as Switch, that it could be a neat idea to save some data to an amiibo and transfer it that way. Again, this does not happen. So in the end, this video has two successful predictions and three duds. Alas. Only two weeks later, we'd get a new trailer for the game, which I would pick apart frame by frame. Mostly I talk about details that are shown in the trailer, so the video doesn't have a ton of predictions in it. However, when the steward construct is briefly shown here, I do speculate a bit about it specifically. I do say that I suspect he's linked to the Zonai, which does end up being true. I also mention that the Sky Island architecture is similar but different to the Zonai. Zonai ruins from Breath of the Wild, and that one of them may be an offshoot of the other, or related but not directly the same group. But I don't have more to say at that time than that. I'd call that mostly a success though, except for one point, being that I mistakenly believe the steward construct to be an enemy, but in the end they're friendly little guys, so this ends up being 
uh, half correct, I guess. I also talk at length about this shot specifically. Everything I say here ends up being pretty much accurate, so I'll just play the clip for you and leave it at that. We see the green energy arm again, and I personally believe that this is the moment where it fuses to Link. You can see the markings on his shoulder again, which glow like the hand here. So my thought is that the arm will glow when using some abilities, but will look dark like this most of the time. We get a good look at the hand here as well, which have these sort of gold accessories on top and have these patterns on them of glowing lines and circles. This is distinctly different from the blue Sheikah energy and for me calls more to mind the magic of the Twilight race from Twilight Princess, but as much as I would like to see that, I don't think that's the case. Knowing Nintendo, odds are that this is a new and ancient type of magic, probably relating back to the Zonai, but maybe not. We'll see. I guess that's another point correct. The rest of the video is pretty well just talking about details within the trailer, though I do incorrectly identify this like like as being some kind of Moldorm or Lanmola. Oops. Fast forward to March of 2022 and we get our delay announcement. This is a short update, so I don't do a lot of speculating, but this is the first time that we'd see the decayed Master Sword. And likewise, it would be the first of many Master Sword predictions that I would be completely incorrect about. I speculate here that the glowing energy would be used to repair or purify the blade, not unlike the Goddess Flame from Skyward Sword. However, as we now know, this is actually the moment we send the blade back in time to Zelda instead. I was adamantly against the idea of time travel playing any role in the story until only a few months from release, in fact, so that is something I never really end up predicting correctly, but oh well, let's move on for now. It would be a while before I'd write anything more about the upcoming sequel. That is until we get another trailer during the February 2023 Direct. At that point, I had made some significant changes to my personal workloads, and my hype had reached a boiling point. I couldn't help it, I had to talk about this game. So I'd write a handful of videos that are some of my most speculation-heavy videos ever. In this video titled The Dungeon Potential, in Tears of the Kingdom, I make a lot of deconstructive arguments about how Zelda games previously have handled their dungeons, before going on to talk about the ways that Tears of the Kingdom might tackle them. I'd say upon a rewatch that I was about half correct. I argue that the two locations that we are most likely to find dungeons are among Sky Islands and Deep Underground, which ended up being mostly correct. Both the Wind and Water Temples ended up being in the sky, while the Fire Temple and Construct Factory are found in the depths. We didn't really know what the extent of the depths were at this point, but they are underground, which is what I say in the video. Where I was not quite right was the scope or quantity of dungeons. I even point out specific islands with massive buildings which we now know to be Zonite Forge Island and the Temple of Time, and I speculate that the massive towers could house dungeons within. Sadly, they don't. However, my guess that a cluster of sky islands with puzzles would be a dungeon setting ends up being pretty much exactly what the water temple is, and the wind temple may not be either of those aforementioned towers, but it is a massive structure found in the sky still. So in the end, my speculation was correct in broad strokes, but I was off when talking about a lot of specific details. Shortly afterwards, I would follow that video up with another speculation-heavy video, this time talking more about story predictions and how they would relate to those dungeon ideas I had. Nearly everything I speculate about on this video ends up being incorrect. It all hinged on what I felt was a safe bet, the idea that reforging the Master Sword would be a major plot point of the game. And while that is kind of true, it's not a part of the story that Link himself actively participates in. I figured that the reason we'd be heading into dungeons in the sky or underground would be to find a way to repair the sword, but as we now know, we instead send the sword back in time for Zelda to deal with fixing instead. 
A few weeks later, I would publish this video featuring my friend Hyrule Gamer. I'm actually pretty proud of this one. The video is more focused on the development side of things rather than gameplay and lore. However, one major point and prediction I make in this video is that the Zonai would play a major role in the game, filling a similar role that the Sheikah did in Breath of the Wild, and that we'd learn more about who this mysterious race were. This seems pretty obvious in hindsight, and a lot of people are going to tell me that I wasn't treading new ground with that, but at the time, people were pretty divided on the subject. Of course, this ended up being the case. The Zonai shrines outright replaced the Sheikah shrines, and of course, Zonai constructs and technology are a major part of the game. So overall, I think this video is a win. Followed up by another big L for me. An entire video talking about just the Master Sword, and the idea hinges, again, entirely on the idea that repairing the sword would be a central part of the game's story. I actually really like the main idea of the video, that the Master Sword would be a permanent but very weak fixture in your inventory, and that completing each major dungeon would slowly strengthen it until it's back to full strength. But that is simply not what we get at all. I actually thought it might be the case when I first started playing the game and you begin your adventure in the Great Sky Island with the Decayed Master Sword, but that all falls apart pretty quickly. Pretty well the entire premise of the video ended up being flat out incorrect. My final pre-launch Tears of the Kingdom video with any sort of speculation was actually just going over details and various bits of promotional materials. Mostly it was just talking about that new info, but I do sprinkle in a bit of my own thoughts and predictions here and there. I was incorrect thinking we would be able to still summon Wolf Link. I did, however, correctly guess that we would see more elemental variations of the Gleok, not just the flame one that we saw on the bridge of Hylia in the trailer. I also successfully guessed that our total heart capacity would be a whopping 40. It's a bit out of pocket, but hey, it's a detail that I got correct, so I'll take it. So there you have it, a pretty mixed bag of predictions about Tears of the Kingdom. A fair amount that was pretty on point, but just as much that ended up being completely off base. In hindsight, so much of this feels painfully obvious to me, but at the time we simply didn't know these things, so it's always interesting to look back at that time with the knowledge that we now have. So I'll just end this video off by opening the conversation up to you guys. What's a prediction that you had about Tears of the Kingdom that you're proud of, that maybe ended up correct, or heck, even something you got wrong? Just let me know how you fared down in the comments below or how well your things lined up with mine. Whatever you want to talk about. Either way, that's all for me. I've got to get to work on the next set of dungeon videos, so thank you all so much for watching and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you all so much for watching, and an extra big thanks goes to my supporters across both Patreon and here on YouTube as a channel member. So thank you to Greymage, Brenda, Tetra, Justin, Midnight, Naomi, and Bunny, as well as so many more people, the names of which you're seeing on screen here. Thank you all so much for all of the support, thank you for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye bye